Good afternoon, everyone. This is the gift planning power hour number five. I can't believe it. And like I always say, I look forward to my Tuesdays at one o'clock uh, because it's so nice to see my colleagues join me and to see all familiar names. And it's nice to see that the St. John's family is getting together and uh, we're gonna do a lot of brain activity here because I think Chris is really gonna make us think really hard and we're gonna re-energize ourselves. And I think we'll feel really good after this session. And I think also um, I'm, I'm hoping you get some answers and maybe it lowers your anxiety. I think if you know something, you know, you're, you're better educated about something, um, sometimes you don't have as many fears because you know the no, the unknown is scarier. So I'm hoping that today's uh, session will um, will solve that you know issue for you if, if some of you are, are having that or experiencing that. Um, if some of the people who signed on don't know who I am, my name is Susan Damiani and I am the director of gift planning and also the director of the McCallum Society, which is the St. John's Legacy Society. And today, like I said, we're going to have a conversation about the biology of the coronavirus and the immune system. And here today with us is one of our professors of our biology department, Chris Bazinat. So hello, Chris, thank you for joining us. It's nice to see you. I know we were talking a little bit, maybe some of them heard our conversation, but how are you coping? And also, I know I asked this question during the test run. Um, I don't mean it in this way, but I think you understand where I'm coming from. This time right now with everything, you know, with your background, and I think you, you studied this area intensively, it must be somewhat exciting and so interesting because now you're experiencing it live than, than read, reading about it. Yeah, yes, it is. I, uh, you know, I, I worked on viruses for six years as a graduate student in, at MIT, and um, so I'm sure I have a different view of them than, <laughs> than most people. <laughs> but I do not want to get sick, that's for sure. Uh, but this is an especially interesting time uh, at our house because my wife is a, a labor economist. And so I'm thinking about the virus and she's thinking about the effects on the economy. And so uh, this, this, the, the, it, it's a very interesting time. You know, what is the old Chinese proverb? Where may you live in interesting times? I'm afraid we do. <laughs> That's so true, but I, lo I love the, um... This, well, hopefully you can show the world the synergy of science and economy. Maybe you can solve this problem because I think right now everybody's polarized. I have so many conversations. There's some people leaning to the reason of the economy that we should roll out and then there's the other side, but you know, the virus, it kills people and blah, blah, blah. So. Yeah, I don't think there's any real easy answer. Well, we want to hear from you first uh, to let us know what are viruses all about? How do they work? How does this coronavirus, this ball that we see on TV, all these spikes, <laughs> like what is going on here? We need to know, Chris, you're going to help us today. So let me just let everyone know who we have uh, representing uh, today with such great credentials. Uh, Dr. Bazinet has been on the biology faculty at St. John's since 1993. A native of Massachusetts, although I don't hear it in your voice, he earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin, studied the molecular genetics of virus assembly for his PhD from MIT, and did postdoctoral studies in cell biology and genetics at Case Western Reserve University before joining the St. John's faculty. And his talk will cover some of the basics of virology and the immune system with the focus on coronavirus. We're really happy that you're here and we're so glad that you're part of the St. John's faculty. So I'm gonna turn the screen over to you 
and you can uh, share your PowerPoint with us. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, there it is. I'm going to share my screen. Well, first we'll go to PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, and can you see my PowerPoint? I'm hoping. Yes. Okay. Very there good. There you go. There you go. All right. So, um, you know, this is what they call a. Um, color enhanced probably electron micrograph of uh, virus particles uh, seen through the electron microscope. And what we'll actually be concentrating on today is these little spikes sticking out of the, out of the virus particle because um, those little spikes are actually, this is, this is kind of a two-dimensional slice through the viruses. If you could, if you could see, well, actually you've seen three-dimensional representations with those spikes sticking out all over the place. But it's those spikes that um, basically your immune system sees, and it's your those spikes that um, recognize uh, what we what we call the receptor on the surface of cells that they bind to, and allows the virus to get its way into um, um, your cells or our cells or the victim cells. None of us are going to be victims. Hopefully, so we'll talk briefly about you know the actually the discovery of viruses and then that issue of whether they're really because for a long time it wasn't sure whether they were uh, they're they're sort of halfway between chemicals and 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 biological things um, and then we'll go into the life cycle of viruses the life cycle of uh, SARS virus and uh, with a with a focus on uh, this spike protein, which is the, um, as I say, the, the, the face of the virus that, uh, that our system see, that our cells see, and that our immune system sees, and which is probably the target uh, of the immune system, or, or it is certainly for the flu virus and almost certainly also for the SARS virus. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, briefly about the, the, the life cycle of, of the virus getting into the cell, replicating, building new particles, and it's released from the cell. And then uh, probably the, um, the the very basics of the immune system and how the immune system uh, recognizes uh, enemy molecules or particles or viruses or, or uh, bacteria, for example. Um, and actually, also at the very end, we'll talk about some approaches to making vaccines. So, uh, uh, especially uh, many of you are probably retirees. You may have noticed yesterday that there was a big bump in the stock market, and that is uh, attributed to an announcement from uh, a company in Cambridge, actually right across the street from MIT, which has reported very promising results in um, uh, initial. Uh, vaccine uh, experiments for coronavirus, and that's what got the got the market all hopped up. And so we'll talk about their technology and their approach to it. I'm not sure I'm ready to buy stock myself, but we'll, we'll look at it. So the question is, you know, this chemical or biological. Uh, when viruses were first uh, discovered, um, they were too small to see in the microscope. I mean, the image that we started off with was an image from an electron microscope, which can see things that are much smaller than we can see with a normal light microscope. And the electron microscope hadn't been had hadn't been discovered yet, or hadn't been developed when viruses were first discovered. So there was a bit of a a, a controversy uh, because it was shown that viruses could go through the finest filters that retained all bacteria. So they had to be a lot smaller than bacteria, and that, that fits with not being able to see them in uh, under a, a normal light microscope. Right? But it was also find, found that, you know, you could purify uh, a number of viruses and actually that they would form crystals. And crystals are the basically a, a fingerprint or a sign that something is really chemical 
and not biological. So for example, if you look closely at what comes out of your salt shaker, uh, uh, they're very fine crystals. They're the, the crystallization is the, 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 the fingerprint or the, the uh, it identifies something as being a chemical and not so much uh, a biological because in the crystals, basically um, uh, the molecules in the crystal are, have to arrange themselves in a very irregular array. Uh, and so it turns out that viruses are really, you know, as much like molecules as they are like cells. Uh, and it was actually shown that you could take uh, these crystals of viruses, purified viruses, because crystals are very pure preparations of the chemical, uh, that you could dissolve this crystal and get a uh, lot viral activity out of it. But, but, but the, uh, the material in this crystal could still infect. Actually, it was uh, originally the plant viruses. The viruses were first discovered in, in uh, plants, right? So what, what we have on the left is turnip yellow virus. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what we have on the right. That might be tobacco mosaic virus, but uh, a tobacco uh, leaf virus was the first uh, well discovered and crystallized virus. Right? So, um, so let's look quickly at the viral life cycle. What is the virus? It's a very simple little structure. It really is a molecular structure, right? And it's got two basic components. One is the genetic material. Uh, which it's going to uh, deliver to victim cells or host cells. And uh, that genetic material comes wrapped up in some kind of package, a very simple package. Uh, in the case of the coronavirus, it's uh, a little protein shell around the, uh, the RNA genome. And the RNA or, or the genetic material of a virus can be either DNA or RNA. So we're used to thinking of our genes being uh, the, the genes of animals and plants as being uh, strictly made of DNA. Uh, but it turns out that many viruses have uh, genomes or chromosomes that are made of RNA. We'll talk about our RNA and DNA are very similar. Um, and we'll talk about uh, the difference between them in a bit. Um, and the idea is uh, the this, the simple purpose of the of the, the virus's pur purpose is basically to get to deliver its genome into a cell, right, and to make many copies of that genome, which uh, which is represented by the replication here, right, and also to express the gene. So it uses the machinery of the cell, the energy of the cell, all the resources of the cell to replicate, make more copies of its genome, and also through this process of what we would call uh, transcription and translation to express the protein products of these genes. So what the, the, the conventional definition of a gene is a stretch of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, that encodes a protein, right? And so the genes of the virus are expressed into proteins, and we'll talk, we'll be looking a lot at proteins uh, here, and uh, we'll actually talk a little, I, th I think of, uh, we'll, make, we'll make sense of proteins, okay. And then the final step, of course, is that the proteins assemble into particles with new um, uh, genomes inside of them, and they're released uh, into to the exterior of the cell. Now, the cell may be killed by this, uh, certainly, it's going to be sickened by it, um, or uh, it may simply persist as a virus factory that releases many, many virus particles into uh, its exterior. So one virus infecting a cell uh, can give rise to thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of virus particles from the single cell that it infects. So you can imagine. If 10,000 viruses come out of this infected cell and each of them infects a single cell, then uh, after two generations, you've got 10,000 times 10,000, which is, uh, hmm, let's see, 100 million virus particles. So this is the, the exponential growth that um, 
that we worry about. Um, it's uh, it's it's uh, enormous. And you can see that. Uh, well, actually, let's see. So we have um, uh, a molecular phenomenon. That's 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 why some people have uh, so much. You know why why it's a little bit challenging to understand viruses because basically they are uh, molecular complexes and they invade the cell and take over the cell's molecular machinery, right? And so just to review, most of you have probably seen this, even though it's, it may seem kind of mystical to you that the usual or for our genes, our genes are located in DNA and by a process called transcription, uh, <clears throat> one of the strands of the DNA is copied into a strand of RNA. Now the RNA is very similar to DNA, very similar, it's just a little bit less stable. You can think of it as a temporary copy of the DNA. And of course, uh, what is it? It's a bunch of A's and G's. We, you, you say, what are those A's and G's and C's and T's? And the wonderful thing about this is that you don't have to know what the A's and G's and C's and T's are. You know that inside of a computer, if you look down here on the left, that all the information in the in your computer is somehow stored in a string of ones and zeros, right? Uh, so it's a, a base two. We say there are two different symbols. Well, DNA is, and RNA are simply information stored in strings of four symbols, chemical strings of four symbols, A, T, and C, and G. In RNA, the T is replaced by U. Um, right. And then the RNA, uh, some of the RNAs that are produced, or many of the RNAs, uh, the ones that most people are interested in are called messenger RNAs. They copy, um, uh, they are translated into proteins. Uh, and proteins are uh, simply a sequence of amino acids strung together. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at, uh, we'll get a better understanding of that uh, in a minute. So. Actually, this little asterisk here is that um, is meant to represent reverse transcription. So DNA can be replicated. In other words, from DNA, you can get more copies of DNA. It can be transcribed into RNA by enzymes known as RNA polymerases. And then in only a few, a handful of viruses, uh, is, the, is there the possibility of making from RNA copy of DNA, right? And those are the viruses like uh, like the H of the AIDS virus, the HIV virus, it carries with it within its particle uh, an enzyme that will make copy that will trans or actually reverse transcribe the sequence of bases in the, of the RNA into DNA. And that's what allows uh, HIV and viruses like that to do some nasty stuff. But we'll be focused for the most part on proteins and their uh, their activities and how they interact with each other because that's really the story of of um, the coronavirus. How it gets into uh, our cells is by um, the recognition by its spike protein, which doesn't like what quite look like this, uh, with uh, the ACE2 protein on the surface of our cells, which uh, functions as a kind of a, a doorway that the, that the virus uses to get into our cells. Okay. So actually, another way to think about it is like, like, like I said, I like the, well, I don't know if you do, but I like the, um, the idea of, of, of modeling. Uh, and actually this is, this is a, a theme that you see in lots of modern biology. Uh, the way to think about these, instead of getting all preoccupied with the molecular shapes and the complex uh, chemistry involved, is it, that it really is valid. It really is um, almost uh, perfectly uh, accurate to describe this as simply an informational process, right? So the information in the base four uh, uh, of DNA is transcribed into mRNA. And actually uh, this, this uh, material here, or this slide here, 
um, is actually from uh, the company Moderna or Mode RNA, uh, which uh, made this announcement yesterday about its um, its vaccine trials, right? And so they think of DNA as a uh, as information storage material, right? And they think of the mRNA as software. In other words, it's uh, it's um, information that's going to be uh, expressed and run by the cell. The cell, think of the, the cell as a kind of computer. Literally, the cell is a computer. Its DNA is its operating system. Its mRNA is the software that it's running and the software that it's running produces proteins, which are the, the, the machinery, the, the cogs and the, and the windows and doors and the girders and uh, materials that the cell is actually made out of. And also the, the machinery that runs within the cell. They're all made out of proteins and all those pieces of that machinery are encoded by genes. So the, this uh, this analogy of uh, molecules as information and software is really perfect, right? I mean, the um, when we talk about a computer virus, what we're really talking about is software that it's more like the HIV virus to your computer. It's uh, software that comes in on, let's say, uh, an email. Uh, typically an email message or from a uh, link that you've uh, clicked on in a website that goes into the operating system of your DNA that gets reverse transcribed into the operating system of your DNA of your computer and then takes over the operation of your computer, right? Um, So here we're here. We're looking at the the life cycle of the SARS virus. Uh, we have the RNA uh, genome internally. There's a, a protein and membrane bound structure. There's actually a surface membrane that you can't see very well here. Uh, uh, and then these spikes that we all we're always looking at or seeing in all of those pictures on TV, and what we call the the viral receptor. ACE2, right? Um, and of course, this protein that we think of the re as a, a receptor in this context, it's a, it's a receptor for the virus, but of course, it didn't evolve as that. It does something for the cell, and actually ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. And actually what it normally does is it processes uh, a hormone that's responsible for controlling uh, vaso and bronchial constriction and dilation. So I suspect that um, a lot of these, say, circulatory issues uh, and bronchial issues associated with the coronavirus could be uh, caused by um, malfunction or loss of function of this ACE2 protein, which controls, uh, which which has a role in controlling uh, bronchial and and um, uh, and vaso uh, constriction and dilation, right? So that's that's veins and arteries and airways, right? So um, uh, the RNA gets in, and actually the RNA of the virus can actually it's it's interpreted by the cell as being a messenger RNA. So it's uh, the cell uh, uh, is fooled into translating this RNA into the proteins of the virus, right? Which then go along, and this this, this represents uh, a bunch of the different proteins uh, that are produced from uh, this RNA. One of the one of the proteins that's initially produced is a, a, another polymerase that will produce many more uh, RNAs for a lot, all the proteins of the virus. Uh, but to make a long story short, um, uh, new virus particles are assembled and then released into uh, the uh, exterior of the cell. Um, 
Okay, so about this protein thing, one way of uh, thinking about uh, this translation of proteins, right, is that there are uh, part of the machinery of the cell is known as ribosomes, which move along the spiral of any RNA that's being translated and read the code, the sequence of bases, uh, nucleotide bases in the RNA, and uh, translate it or build a string of amino acids into a protein. So, so that's why, why we, we say transcription from DNA to RNA is you know, changing from one, one language to a very similar language, right? Uh, but it's here in trans, true, really a true molecular translation that a sequence of amino acids, which are very different from the bases that uh, form uh, the, the units of RNA and DNA, are built. And I like to think of them, uh, actually, this is my, my new analogy for proteins as these little pop beads. So uh, uh, many of you are, are probably familiar with these, right? So they, they come in lots of different colors and shapes, um, uh, but they, uh, they can be strung together in almost any kind of, uh, of sequence because all of them have at one end uh, a pin, right? and at the other end, a hole. And so you can string these pop beads together in any sequence that you want. Uh, and so um, that's the way to think about proteins, right? The proteins are made from amino acids, and I'm gonna show you actually, if I can. Uh, don't get overwhelmed with these structures. The, Important thing is that all of them have what we call, the, you can think of them as the pin and the hole of our little protein pop beads are uh, a, a carboxyl group, that little COO, you can see there's one here and one here. All of the amino acids have one, right? And they have to have one in order to be strung together in this, in this, uh, mean so in, a, in, a, in a protein, right? And they also have one of these, which is what we could know as an amino group. See, there's one here and one here and one here and one here and one here. So when we make a protein, what we're actually doing is we're stringing together these amino acid pop beads, the, the, the car, carboxy group here uh, interacts with the amino group here of another amino acid, and we can think of this as uh, so. Let's see. This this actually it's probably better to think of the amino group as the the pin and the carboxy group as the whole, right? So that uh, they can be strung together in lots of different sequences, right? And actually, what you can see is there are the, the, there are 20 common amino acids, right? And so the language of proteins is a base. 20 language, right? And um, so, for example, what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, uh, the A's and T's and C's and G's in, in, in this line here are the sequence of nucleotide bases in uh, a coronavirus gene, the coronavirus gene that encodes uh, that spike protein, right? And then the ribosome translates that into a sequence of amino acids, which are represented with one, so this is methionine, phenylalanine, valine, every three bases are used to define each amino acid, right? That's being um, incorporated into this string. You can see, uh, what are we going up to here? We've got about 400 ton bases. Uh, this, this is only about a third of the spike protein gene, right? So the whole spike protein, I think it's about 1,200 amino acids. So you can imagine how many, uh, it, it turns out there's basically an infinite number of possible proteins that could be encoded using this system, right? It's believed that only a very tiny fraction of all the possible proteins in the universe have been 
tried out by evolution in the four billion years of life on Earth. Right? There's a tremendous potential, right? And um, and what that means is that there are a huge, overwhelmingly huge number of potential protein structures. Why is that? Well, we're going to talk about the the high school social dynamics model of protein folding. You can imagine if you if you strung together, um, let's say, uh, an athlete and then uh, a, a language scholar and a uh, a poet and uh, a theater enthusiast and an opera buff and a you know all those different groups and uh, and an asocial person and uh, and a super social person and. Uh, in in a long, long, long string, how would that string fold up? In other words, the the interactions or the propensities for each of the individuals along that string to interact with each other or, or to be repelled by each other would cause this string to fold up in a particular way. Um, uh, and it turns out that that structure that the protein folds up in is defined, it's consistent from protein, for every copy of the protein that's made will fold up in that same way. And that we know that for the most part, that structure is determined by this sequence of amino acids in the protein, right? Uh, and now each amino acid has for example, a dozen or a couple dozen, somewhere between a dozen and three dozen atoms in it, right? And a protein can be um, very, uh, it can be a few dozen amino acids long, or it can be thousands of amino acids long, right? But what that means is that the protein molecule actually has many, uh, typically has thousands or sometimes many thousands of atoms. And if we look at uh, the structure of it, for example, this is a, a protein structure here where we see. Um, all of the atoms of the protein of a blood clotting factor. So this is the protein that's uh, that's mutated or deformed in the most common form of uh, hemophilia, right? And our brains can't deal with this comp complexity of structure, but you can see that there are places where there are cracks and crevices, and those cracks and crevices correspond to places that the protein will interact with or bind to other proteins in a very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, shape-specific way. Um, the way most biologists look at proteins these days is uh, through ribbon diagrams where the side chains, all the atoms of those, uh, of those uh, personality groups along the, the sides of the amino acids, are not shown, and we just we just look at what we know as a ribbon diagram, where the the shape of the backbone of the protein, the actual the the thread of the con the continuous thread of the backbone of the protein is shown in what's known as a ribbon diagram, um, that helps us make a little more sense of them. And these ribbon diagrams were. Uh, originated by uh, a woman named Jane Richardson at Duke University. This is one of her uh, uh, beautiful diagrams of uh, the structure of uh, a DNA polymerase. Okay, so um, I'm sure you've all seen these models of the particle and there are these little triangle things sticking out from the, uh, and those triangle uh, those triangles represent the spike protein. Let's see if we can. Let's see if we can find that. Okay. So this is the ribbon diagram. Can you see that? I hope you can see this of that spike protein and why is it why is it triangular? Well, it's actually because, and actually what I love about this site is it allows you to manipulate the molecule and like rotate it around, things like that. So the orange and the green and the purple represent 
uh, three different copies of this spike protein. Uh, and at this end of the molecule down here, where you see all these helical shapes, those are known as alpha helices. They're typical of many different, uh, there, it's a structure that's found in many proteins. It's, it's called a secondary structure motif, is what's sticking into the membrane of the, of the particle, and it actually will mediate the, um, the fusion of the particle's membrane with the cell's membrane. Uh, to release the uh, genome into the cell. And this part out here where you see these, uh, is, these are known as more sheet-like structures or beta, beta sheets. Uh, this part is the part of the protein that interacts with the ACE2 receptor. Um, and actually, what you see here is um, the spike protein, the portion of the spike protein is in orange that interacts with and binds with the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cell. So you can see there's kind of like a, the shape is um, kind of complementary to this shape in here. If we zoom in more, it's possible to, to zoom in more. Actually, you start to see some more of the molecular details. But here are the, here's an example of that protein-protein interaction between the spike protein and the ACE2 receptor and the particular side chains of the amino acids, which we don't see normally in the rhythm diagram represented here. So you can see there's a uh, these, these dotted lines represent hydrogen bonds between uh, uh, probably an amino group on the spike protein and a carbonyl group of the, uh, of the uh, receptor, and there are more interactions here. So that's uh, the hand and glove. You can think of that as a, the hand glove um, uh, protein protein interaction. And of course, this is, this follows the paradigm of molecular biology that uh, the intricate, beautiful, incredibly specific um, function uh, of biological functions dictated by genes are all mediated through this kind of, uh, or, or, or most of them anyways, are mediated through this very, uh, uh, traditional, well, what you call it, that it's often referred to as the lock and key mechanism, right? That these macromolecules whose very complex shape is determined by the sequence of amino acids uh, in it, they interact with each other in this very intimate uh, way uh, that depends on the sequence of amino acids that made them fold up this way, right? So let's cut to the chase about what this whole uh, thing is about um, just as this interaction between the coronavirus spike protein and the ACE receptor on the um, cell surface uh, is mediated by this fine molecule. We can call it a, an instance of molecular recognition, right? So uh, the immune system is going to fight the coronavirus by uh, the same uh, kind of mechanism right? that uh, in which proteins of the immune system will recognize the coronavirus by um, by the same sort of uh, intimate and perfectly fitting protein protein interaction, right? And use that uh, that recognition to uh, isolate the virus and neutralize it, right? And the, the, uh, the secret magic of the immune system is that, um, well, the, the, the molecules of the immune system or the proteins of the immune system that will be, uh, that recognize foreign invaders, let's say like viruses and bacteria, they're known as antibodies and 
T cell receptor genes. So I know you've heard a lot about antibodies. Uh, but you don't hear so much about T cell receptor genes, right? But the idea is this, that within your immune system, uh, millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions, I don't know the exact number, but millions of new B cells and T cells are born uh, every day in our immune system, right? And the molecular magic of the, the immune system is that just within those cells, there is a molecular mechanism that continues to mutate and modify the genes encoding antibodies and T cell receptors proteins. It's kind of mind boggling. It was really, it was really uh, figured out in the 70s, but the idea is this, that if you had to encode all of the possible proteins that the immune system makes for antibodies and T cell receptors to identify and bind to anything that the universe can throw in it, throw at it, right? That the potential, uh, the, ver the variability in these proteins is more than could be encoded in the whole human genome. So that was a big, big, big mystery, right? We've got just so many bases of DNA in our genomes, uh, but somehow the immune system produces antibodies and T cell receptor proteins with uh, a variety that's greater than could, much greater than could be accounted for by the size of our genomes. And it turns out that what our genomes are doing or what those T cells and B cells are doing is they're mutating those antibody and T cell receptor genes so that whenever a new T cell or B cell is born, it's making its own very own little, uh, uh, a single, um, uh, a unique antibody or T cell receptor protein. Uh, it's okay if your mind is boggled by that because mine still is too, right? But let's look at the, the idea of the, the antibody. So the, the antibody is, uh, um, it's uh, a, a protein, it's a co protein complex actually. What you can see the blue here represents uh, one kind of protein chain, right? And the pink here represents the second, what's called a light chain and a heavy chain, because the heavy chain is longer and bigger and it weighs more in terms of light. But the important thing is, if you look at the ends of this, the, the, um, the molecule is bivalent. So at this end, there's one, uh, I, I like to think of this as the, uh, it's called the effector region. I like to think of it as the handle. It's the, it's the part of an antibody that the immune system recognizes as an antibody. And it's always the same, or all, nearly always the same in most antibodies. But up here, is what we call the variable region. This is the part of the protein, uh, uh, the genes of which are being constantly modified and switched around and recombined and mutated in immune cells so that um, the shape of every uh, T cell or B cell, or let's say these are made by B cells, right? The shape of every B cell's antibody is complementary in its variable region to a unique, what we call an antigen, right? Um, and so this could be the coronavirus uh, spike protein, for example, right? And so the idea is this in B cell, uh, let's, let's look at, these around here. Uh, that when a B cell is born, its antibodies are expressed on the surface of the B cell, right? And the binding of that pathogen to the B cell receptor actually stimulates the B cell to grow, right? Um, and, um, oh boy, the immune system is a little complex, but the, 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 um, the bottom line is that that B cell stimulated in that way will do two things. It will divide many times. It will, uh, uh, so it will be amplified in the immune system and it will secrete antibodies, which are basically soluble. No, they're, they're pieces of this B cell receptor that have, are slightly modified so that they're free to circulate 
in the blood and the lymph, right? And they'll bind the pathogen, whatever it is, um, uh, to allow it to be neutralized. Other cells in the immune system that recognize these handle ends of the antibodies will engulf this pathogen and, uh, and neutralize it, eat it up, degrade it, right? The other thing uh, that the, these B cells will do is they will ingest some of this pathogen and cut it up into little pieces, cut the proteins from it up into little pieces and display them actually on another class of surface molecules known, uh, known as major histocompatibility complex molecules, right? So th these are called that because they were first discovered or they're known as the major determinants of uh, compatibility for tissue and organ donation, right? So the genes that encode the MHC proteins are the genes um, that are tested if you're going to be uh, screened for, uh, let's say, uh, for kidney donation or uh, liver transplant or, or heart transplant, whatever, the, 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 the organ that's coming into you has to have the same MHC class uh, or very similar MHC class genes so that the proteins expressed on the surface of your cells, because these MHC class genes are expressed on the surface of all cells, uh, won't be recognized as foreign to you. But what they do is they actually, they present those bits of protein to T, T cells, right? Uh, and this, blue, this light blue molecule here is a T cell receptor. Right. But the bottom line is that uh, the recognition of the pathogen by a B cell receptor, right, will lead to the amplification, the clonal amplification. In other words, so most of the B cells in your body, they will uh, they will never see antigen. They won't. Um, they won't be amplified in this way. But once a B cell is activated. Many, many copies of it are made, and there some of them are called these, these what's shown here is a plasma cell. Uh, let's see. <laughs> but the idea is through this kind of recognition. Um, T cells and B cells are activated and amplified and they stand waiting in your body to, uh, to attack this pathogen if it reoccurs. And uh, the other thing about T cells, this is a helper T cell. This is a, oops, uh, the, the, the helper T cells um, uh, secrete cytokines, which are hormones that will activate uh, the body for uh, fighting the disease so that helper cells get activated this way. What's not shown here is, let's see, uh, uh, let's look at T cells again. Um, so that's a helper T cell, right? It's T cell receptor, uh, recognizes the parts of the attacker that are basically presented on the outside of this cell, this antigen uh, presenting cell, right, to activate it. More interestingly, uh, let's say you have a cell that's been infected with a coronavirus, and what it's doing is it's all it's taking a little fraction. This is what all cells do. They take a small fraction of all the proteins being synthesized. They break them up into pieces and they display them on the surface of the cell on another kind of MHC molecule. So you can think of this MHC molecule as a kind of a platform that's used to present to T cells uh, bits of protein from the interior of the infected cell. And if a cytotoxic T cell, or let's say a killer T cell, or more, more commonly referred to as killer T cells, recognizes this, right, what does that mean? It means that this cell is infected with in our case, it would be coronavirus, 
and the cytotoxic T cell has mechanisms to actually kill this cell, kill infected cells. So the, the strategy is, well, before this cell, if this cell is just going to, it has been turned into a virus factory and it's just uh, producing lots and lots of viruses that are going to uh, attack and kill other cells, the cytotoxic T cell will kill it so that uh, if this cell is dead, then there's no energy, there's no, um, there's no neither energy nor materials for the virus inside to continue to replicate, right? So um, let's say, uh, uh, this is a, a slide about the, uh, how uh, antibody bound virus or bacteria are, are recognized by uh, the complement system, and then uh, basically gobbled up uh, by macrophages, cells that can uh, degrade or digest these other materials, right? So let's talk just a little bit about uh, vaccine development. The idea of most vaccine developments is, is to simply find a way of presenting the immune system, presenting to your body, right, uh, protein, like protein that would allow it to recognize the virus. So in other words, you're immunized with the spike protein, right? In some form. Now it could be uh, the various uh, approaches taken are to uh, to put the COVID, one of the, uh, you probably maybe heard about the Oxford University in England, the Jenner Institute. Their approach is to put the spike protein gene uh, into the genome of a harmless virus so that when that harmless and then and then actually inoculate you with that harmless virus <clears throat> and so the idea is that the end the covid spike protein will be expressed in your system uh, by that harmless virus your immune system will uh, recognize the spike protein and form a reaction against it so that let's say a month down the road or two months down the road if you are actually infected with COVID spike protein, you have uh, clonally amplified B cells and T cells are ready to attack the spike protein and kill any, uh, attack the virus and kill any cells that have been infected by it, right? And we simply uh, inoculate subjects uh, with, um, with our experimental vaccine, right? Now, the yesterday's big news was that, uh, and, and this seemed like a crazy idea when it was first tried. And of course, you know, basically uh, most great ideas start as many are, if not most, uh, start as crazy ideas, right? And so for years, the approach to making vaccines is you use actually an inactivated form of the virus, or more recently, a piece of the virus. To, um, to immunize people, right? And the big news uh, is that it turns out that if you just uh, inoculate the mRNA molecule, that, that software molecule uh, that encodes the spike protein, that cells will take up the mRNA and translate it and show it to the immune system, right? And so that's what the big uh, the big deal yesterday was about. Uh, uh, Moderna's uh, uh, they're in Cambridge, actually they're right across the street from from MIT. Uh, their idea is they make basically uh, a, a lipid molecule, which is basically uh, 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 kind of a, a fat droplet that you might see in in many cosmetics, right? But uh, inside of it, they've included uh, packages of uh, RNA, RNA that includes, encodes uh, a piece of the coronavirus, right? And so these little packages are taken up by cells, right? Uh, the mRNA is expressed into coronavirus protein, right? And that coronavirus protein activates the immune system so that uh, someplace down the line, if um, uh, if uh, 
a person is uh, infected with real coronavirus, that uh, the antibodies and the B cells and the T cells that are required to combat it will already be uh, mobilized in this person, right? And yesterday's uh, news was that I, it's still a very small sample. I think they only did they did uh, eight patients, right? But they all tolerated it uh, very well, and they all have uh, developed uh, antibody titers. That is, they're all producing antibodies against the coronavirus that uh, is comparable or very similar to the levels of antibodies produced by people who have actually been infected by the coronavirus. So, um, you know, the, uh, I think the, the, the big stock market bounce yesterday was due to the fact that uh, this kind of news makes it look like we really may have uh, um, a, uh, a vaccine uh, earlier than the year and a half, two years, or multiple years that a lot of the experts have been warning us about uh, because uh, so many different approaches are being taken and people are looking very hard at, uh, at doing that. So actually, I'll just open up the floor for questions now. Um, yes, thanks, Chris. Let's see. What we have, anyone have any questions for Chris? That was great presentation. You brought me back to my college days in biology class. <laughs> and I wanna thank you for the stock tip. <laughs> I might just look into that company. <laughs> you know, usually by the, time, by the time we hear about this stuff, it's usually too late. The big boys have uh, gobbled it up. So. Oh, too bad. Who knows? I, was, I would have said it was too late to to uh, to invest in Amazon three years ago, but look what Amazon has doubled or tripled in two or three years. So maybe <laughs> the thing is that most of the people that need this uh, this vaccine won't be able to pay much for it, and the, the pharmaceutical companies haven't shown a lot. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, interest in vaccine production uh, for for a long time because. Uh, for most infectious diseases, the people that need vaccines the most are poor. And so there's not much money in making vaccines. Um, but uh, I guess it's different when rich people are being infected too. I hear you. We have a couple of questions. I don't know if you see, there's one about high blood pressure. There was a talk that high blood pressure was a factor, yet don't many take ACE2 inhibitor drugs to control high blood pressure? And does the ACE2 inhibitor help protect or increase risk of getting COVID? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly what uh, what the relationship between. Um, I know. I think that ACE two uh, inactivates. My understanding was that ACE two actually um, might help control uh, high blood pressure, but I'm not sure. All right. Uh, so does the ACE2 inhibitor help protect or increase risk of getting COVID? Yeah, that yeah, that is an open question. I think it's hard to say. But yeah, lots of people take high blood pressure med medication. My wife is on it. I don't know if it's an ACE2 inhibitor drug. That may um, I've never actually looked into the the molecular mechanism of um, of the blood. The, uh, the the blood pressure medications, um, but I, I, it wouldn't surprise me that there's some relationship, right? Um, mm. High blood pressure is a factor, so I think I think anything, any condition that someone has that affects circulation, blood pressure, uh, 
either the arteries or the veins or the air passages, right, or subbronchial things, they say asthma patients, and, um, right, that they are uh, obviously at higher risk uh, because of the, I, well, I don't know. I, I, th I think the doctors, and I should be too, I should be conservative about linking the two, but I just can't help but be suspicious of the fact that um, that lots of the secondary effects. So, for example, this pediatric multiple inflammation syndrome, right, uh, is um, is a syndrome of uh, of, of circulation, basically. You know, circulation gone, uh, local circulation effects gone, kind of uh, uh, gone awry. Um, all over the bodies of the, the kids who are affected. And so I think that what can be happening is that where the, where the virus infects, that um, the communication pathways between the immune system and the circulatory system are getting crossed somehow. And um, because there are very complex interactions between the two. In other words, when uh, when you have uh, an infection, a local infection somewhere, one of the things that, that your circulatory system does is it loosens up the connection between cells in the, in the blood vessels to allow white cells to go right out of the blood vessels through those cells into the, the damaged area. And so, um, and basically that's what inflammation is, uh, is that you have uh, basically loss of pressure in those areas. Um, so anyways, I wouldn't be surprised. In other words, if there are lots and lots and lots of coronavirus particles at, at some point, some place in your body, then there's a good chance that the ACE2 is being internalized with it at high levels. And so the, um, the mm -hmm. control of blood pressure in that area of the body is going to be affected potentially. Like, I, I, I can't get more specific than that. Yeah, I didn't know that about inflammation. That's interesting. I never knew that. No. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. White, white blood cells, they go right through the, right through the body of the, of, um, veins and arteries uh, uh, to be released into in, in inflamed areas. Um, but that makes, uh, basically that's, that's the, uh, that makes for a local reduction in blood pressure because some of the blood is going out with those white cells. And that's what actually, what the problem with sepsis is when you hear about someone who yes. has sepsis, mm -hmm. it's because the whole body, all of the all of the blood vessels, all over the body are loosening up that way, and the blood pressure goes way down, and all all the critical organs uh, lose. Uh, See this other question we have here: Why is plasma cells of recovered patients helping? Yeah, so it's not necessarily it's not necessarily the the plasma cells. Of recovered patients, what what the plasma is is the fluid of the blood that's had all the cells removed from it. If you're a recovering patient, what that means is that your plasma probably contains lots of antibodies against the coronavirus, right? So the idea is, if you have someone who's really sick, that giving them an injection of anti-coronavirus antibodies might help them. To overcome the infection. That's what it's really about. So what's your feeling of what's going on now in terms of containing the virus? Um, do you feel, you know, testing is, is very important? Um, antibody testing versus nasal, you know, they do the swab. What really gives you the best indicator? Well, a good antibody test, apparently there are a lot of bad antibody tests out there, and the FDA has been recalling uh, most of them. Uh, the, the good thing about an antibody test is it could potentially tell you if you've been exposed already, right? 
So a lot of us uh, are scared to death. Uh, well, let's say we're, let's say we're scared, but we're, we're worried and being very conservative about uh, social distancing and those kinds of things. Uh, many people in that situation have actually been infected already without knowing it. Right? So most people infected by the coronavirus are asymptomatic. Right? And so it would be a relief to people to know that they've been infected already. Chances are, if they have antibodies against COVID, it means they were infected and they either had no symptoms or they've completely recovered and they're probably okay to be out there, right? Um, and that would allow us to, uh, to screen people. In other words, anybody, uh, the, the, the best way to relax the economy would be to uh, let everybody with, uh, with antibodies against it out to work. Um, and I'd really like to know, I, I took a couple of trips to, uh, to Seattle back and forth or uh, the end of January and then the end of February when Seattle was a hot spot and New York, probably the New York airports were uh, <laughs> a major uh, artery, right? Um, and after, you know, a couple of weeks, uh, well, it's about a week after my first trip, I thought I had the flu. And um, I, I really felt terrible. I, t I took to my bed for a night and that could have been COVID. Uh, and so I, I, I'd kind of like to know. Right. So the antibody test would help a lot. So you really do feel that the antibody is, is one of the defenses right now until we have the vaccine? Yeah, that's a yeah. Because you're living with the economist and I'm sure she's telling you, we have to get out. We have to get out. We can't live like this. So how do we, how do we, how do we roll out? Obviously the social distancing, the washing of the hands, um, but sometimes that doesn't always work for everybody. Mm -hmm. If some people are more susceptible, obviously. The good antibodies would allow us to um, phase in more conservatively. In other words, if everybody's, they, there's an estimate that 20% of the New York City population is I know, I heard that. For, for antibodies, right? Mm. It's an amazing study. Mm. Done, I think they took um, uh, women who were going into the hospital at uh, Columbia Presbyterian to give birth. So the idea was this would be a cross section of healthy women, right? They're giving birth. But 20% of the ones they tested were positive for the coronavirus antibodies. Right. Wow. Um, and so that could potentially, if that's, if that holds for the rest of the city, it's probably 30% by now, who knows? Uh, and what's the, COVID. what's the explanation though for, you know, they were saying that in California, it's one virus and then New York, it's a different virus, different type of coronavirus. So if you have the antibody, say I get tested in New York and New York says, well, you have the antibody. Does that mean when I go to California, I may not have the antibody for that particular mutation? Is it a mutation? I don't know. You're the scientist. Make sure I'm saying these things correctly. I don't know if I'm explaining it correctly. No, no, the no, mutations no. In, the, in the virus happen all over the genome. All over the, there's uh, the genome is 30,000 bases long. That's how long uh, compared to ours. Ours is 3 billion bases, right? So the coronavirus, the information in the coronavirus genome is what is it, 30,000, 10 of a fourth compared to 10, three times, uh, one one hundred thousand of the human genome, right? So it's a little, just a little speck of information. Um, and when they look at the mutations in the virus to trace, um, they're seeing mutations all over the genome, uh, most of which or will have no effect on how our, your immune system uh, deals with the virus. So any of them, the vast majority of them are what, we, what, what are known as silent mutations. They don't really, uh, because of what we call the degeneracy of the amino acid code, remember the three bases that are translated into one amino acid. Well, the third base is highly variable 
And you can very often change that third base without changing the amino acid sequence of the protein. So most of those mutations don't affect, uh, there's no evidence yet that any of those mutations in particular affect um, the infectivity or the uh, aggressiveness of the virus. Uh, although actually, actually there was a report this week, uh, someone claims that there is a correlation, there has been a claim that there's a correlation between the expansion of one particular mutant clone, you could call it, and, um, and infectivity. Uh, but that's been hotly, it's being hotly debated, being hotly debated, right? But, the, but in general, um, it's not believed that the changes in the, the changes in the sequence really affect that. So in other words, we would expect your antibodies directed against COVID that came over in a plane from Europe to work perfectly well against uh, COVID that you might pick up in San Francisco from, uh, from an Asian uh, right. origin. Oh, that's good to hear. Because I'm just thinking, you know, last week we were talking about travel. So if you're traveling to different countries, I was just concerned if you would, you know, still be protected if someone said that you had the antibodies. And, and that is the question. I mean, if you have the antibodies, you're saying then you may not get the virus, or is that exactly true? That's usually the case, although um, people are being very conservative about this, so we don't know for sure. So I've heard a report that there was a, a new cluster of coronavirus infections in Wuhan, the city in China where it, it originated, right? And that this new cluster traces back to someone who was sick two months ago or three months ago, right? So what does that mean? This guy had the virus and um, uh, either he got reinfected, uh, in which case his any antibodies he had didn't seem to have helped him out much, right? or you know, I'm not sure what, which is worse, uh, or the, the virus has managed to persist in his system uh, in spite of uh, in spite of his having been previously affected, infected. So, for example, it may not have been uh, completely. It may not be completely cleared from some people. You know, it's like a typhoid Mary situation, right? Uh, <laughs> which would not be good. Which would not be good. No, that's not good. Now, vaccine development, you were talking about, I have a, a quick question. So they're developing the vaccine. You said that there was um, about the mRNA cells, that that um, may be something positive in terms of the vaccine development. But, you know, in, in, in your presentation, to me, it, it's such, it, it seems like a map. You know, everything is mapped out so beautifully. I mean, it looks complicated. Again, this is a non-scientist, you know, describing this, but to me, it just looks like this is a nice map and a nice pathway that it should be easy to develop a vaccine because you should be able to see the path or where how everything's mapped out. And wouldn't you see then where the problems lie with the virus and then say, okay, that's where we have to go to correct it. And so it should be simple and easy. We should have a vaccine by next week, Chris. Come on, what's going on? <laughs> why is this so okay. difficult? Why does it take so? It. Why does it take so long? Why yeah, is it well, um, for for one thing, uh, actually, this what I noticed uh, when I, I went and looked at this Moderna's um, or Mode RNA. I'm not sure how they pronounce it. I looked. I went to their website yesterday. And they just announced uh, a new stock offering. They're trying to raise $1.3 billion. Why? Because to scale up this kind of thing, right, it's one thing to do it on a laboratory bench and uh, make, an, make enough of this material to, uh, to inject uh, uh, a dozen patients and see what happens. It's another thing to, to make um, 
Well, what are the, how many people we got on the planet? Six billion uh, doses. Right? So we're going through phase two and phase three where they're testing uh, much larger pools of people, and, they'll, and then they'll then they'll have to test it against uh, 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 different risk groups and uh, different age groups, things like that. But I'm sure it will be, be you know, and it's not just this particular one, you know, what, what the Gates Foundation is trying to do is trying to identify, uh, you know, uh, six or eight or a dozen or so uh, of the most promising vaccine uh, projects and start building factories right away even before we know which one is going to work. And the idea is that, well, five or six months from now, when we're pretty sure that uh, which ones are going to be um, most successful or most effective, that we'll already have a factory built to start turning out uh, millions of, of doses. Uh, but it, it all takes time. No, I, I'm kidding around because I actually worked for a biotech firm. So, and they were they were working on vaccines for HIV. So I saw, you know, the clinical trials that went on and and the protocols and all the time and, but also you know FDA holding it up a lot. So I think now they at least have that, um, that that they don't that to deal with. Yeah, they're giving them. It'll be fast track. Sure. Right, right. So that that should help it uh, for them to produce it faster, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and a vaccine would if if you have one vaccine, you don't have to worry again about everyone's individual DNA. You know, different cultures, different countries. One vaccine would work for everybody. Well, probably. Hmm. But then again, you never know until you try it. Right. Um, right. You know, and the, and the other thing is this mRNA vaccine, right? You know, maybe maybe they they made a batch and they said, okay, this is bad. Let's infect these guys. And maybe the two months that it's spent on the shelf since then, it's no longer active. Who knows? Can you make a, can you make the stuff and then ship it to Nigeria and it's still hmm. good there? Does it have to be refrigerated? Right. What's the shelf life? Uh, it's true. All, all of those are issues in the scaling. In scaling no. up. So I'm not buying any more dinner stock yet. <laughs> all right. We're getting, we're actually a little over time, but I do want to answer everyone's questions. We had one. What is the mechanism for the hydroxychloroquine uh, that is apt to cause that to work, and is it an antibiotic that kills a live cell? Um, I don't know what the mechanism is. Uh, the chloroquine and its derivatives were originally um, uh, derived for malaria, so it's an anti-malarial. Um, and uh, I'm not familiar with uh, with the uh, with the mechanism, I don't know the chemical mechanism, uh, but uh, from what I've heard, uh, the recent tests haven't shown any particular uh, any kind of strong effect. Anyways, you know that's been controversial. Yes, it has. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Does anyone have additional questions, Sue? I'm going to just check with Sue. She has. Here's one. You have another one? Modification on, a modification to have application for Alzheimer's disease, an RNA modification. Uh, well, certainly that's what Moderna wants to do. They they think that they'll be able to, um, to develop therapeutics for many different kinds of diseases using this. this um, using this, what they call the mRNA platform. Uh, it's not clear to me exactly how that would work, uh, but who knows, they, they, they may have some ideas. Um, there has been some, there have been some very exciting developments in understanding 
uh, the basic molecular etiology of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Uh, and so there could be some, uh, some drug development that comes out of the, those discoveries. The last, the last few years, there's been a very exciting development in the field of cell biology uh, known as the, the disordered protein. So remember, we, 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 we made a big deal, or biologists tend to make a big deal about that lock and key effect about protein, very intricate, defined structure. Uh, and it turns out that there are many more proteins than wherever uh, that, that have kind of blobby regions, regions that don't have any defined structure. Uh, and it turns out uh, that they're called disordered protein regions. And it turns out that those proteins, uh, if you look at the neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, that all of those proteins that accumulate in plaques, degenerative plaques, are in this, fa this family of proteins that have large disordered regions. So there's some new, uh, almost like a new paradigm coming into cell and molecular biology that's going to have to deal with uh, what these distorted regions do for proteins and why they're so prominent, uh, actually, in so many uh, proteins associated with uh, neurodegenerative diseases. It's kind of an exciting region for the future. That's great. That is very exciting. And Alzheimer's, obviously, is very you know, prevalent now. Unfortunately, right, before I get there, you know, I'm getting close. Don't say it. No, we're living longer, right? We're living longer, so that's true. That's, uh, and I would say living longer, you know, with cancer and all that too, right? The cells get older. So is that a lot of? Is that a reason why you see sometimes some of these, you know, like Alzheimer's and stuff, disease is more prevalent because we are living longer because our cells are getting older? Is that the reason? Well, some, some tissues can regenerate cells much more easily than others. And the brain and the nervous system are notoriously poor at doing that. So the idea mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. if you have a stroke and it damages one part of the brain, the way you recover from the stroke is by having another part of your brain learn how to do the stuff that that part that the, that the damage mm -hmm. is. No, no, it's true. Yeah, our cells get old especially brain cells. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see any more questions and I think we're way over time, but thank you so much for your time in uh, talking about viruses and the biology of the coronavirus. It's, it's very fascinating. Uh, I just, you know, we all pray that we can get a vaccine sooner than later, but we understand it does take time as you explained. But um, I'm positive that we will develop one. In the meantime, we just have to keep washing our hands. <laughs> it's the only thing I could think of. It's social distance, right? And wear a mask when you're outside. That's the best we can do. Well, thanks, Chris. Stay healthy. Be well. Thank, thank you, you everyone. for. Yes, thank you for joining us again. We'll see you next week, Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We have... Uh, alumnus John Separano, 1984 graduate from College of Business Administration, will be talking to us about the CARES Act. Uh, so now we're going to be talking about the economy uh, side of things, Chris. <laughs> Today was scientific. Next week is the economy. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.